So today we're going to be discussing your discussion question, which is basically on how muscles contract. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the notes first, and then you're going to find a second video where I'm going to be drawing out this so that you have kind of an image of what this looks like on paper. Um, so when you finish watching the notes, I would suggest that you go and watch the video and draw out the picture along with me and then go back and watch this video again so that you can follow along with your picture so that you'll be prepared for your discussion question. So when a muscle is going to contract, um, before it can contract, the brain the nerves and the muscle have to connect up. So where the nerve meets the muscle, we call that the neuromuscular junction. It's just basically where the motor neuron and the muscle fiber meet. So nerve impulses travel from our brain down through our spinal cord out to our motor neurons where they then touch a muscle fiber at the end and lead to a contraction. Now, um, for skeletal muscle, our skeletal muscle is a voluntary muscle, which means that every movement, our brain commands our muscle to do that. Once again, there are some times where our muscles don't behave. We'll talk about those later in this unit. So let's talk about what happens because this is something that we do in a matter of just seconds, but yet is a pretty complicated step process that goes um, from the thought all the way to the contraction, then to the relaxation. So this is a picture of what the neuromuscular junction looks like. Um, this alien looking hand, that's your motor neuron. And where it touches, this is your neuromuscular junction. So the nerve impulse is this arrow that's coming from our brain. So we call that an action potential because it has the potential to create an action in our muscles. So once our brain sends the message out to our body that we need to move, that message goes all the way down the motor neuron till it ends. Um, when it gets to the end of the motor neuron, there are these tiny little vesicles. And a vesicle is just a fancy scientific way of saying little sac. And it's these tiny little vesicles, and inside them is a chemical that is known as acetylcholine. We abbreviate it as ACH. Acetylcholine is hanging out in there where that neuron meets that muscle in this little space called the synapse. So when our brain sends the nerve impulse, that action potential, down the motor neuron and it reaches the end, it signals those ACH vesicles to rupture. So they open up, they release the ACH, and ACH's job is to let sodium in. And of course, of course sodium is a huge ion inside of our body. You know, salt is sodium chloride, and there is a little bit of sodium chloride in everything. So we have lots of sodium just hanging out in our muscle fibers, ready to go inside, but it can't get inside until acetylcholine lets it in. Sodium is one is the main way that we have a contraction. Uh, matter of fact, individuals who are dehydrated, when they go to the hospital to get fluids, they give them a sodium chloride drip, which is like a saline drip, because without sodium, you, you can't even have muscle contractions. So, and that could be, you know, damaging for your heart and as well as other things. So sodium is super important because without it, we couldn't get the ACH in. So let's look at that picture again. So the arrow goes down, it hits the synapse, this little blunt, this little space right here. And those little blue dots, those blue dots are our acetylcholine. Okay. And the acetylcholine now is released. And when it releases, it triggers these little um, channels to allow sodium to go in. 
So at the end of the contraction, when we want our muscles to relax, the only way we can help them to relax is we have to stop sodium from coming in. So when we stop sodium, um, it stops the contraction. So in order to keep sodium from going in, we have to get rid of acetylcholine. Enter an enzyme known as acetylcholine esterase. Acetylcholine esterase breaks down acetylcholine. When there's no more acetylcholine, there can't be any more sodium coming in. And then we pump out the remaining sodium using something called our sodium potassium pump, which you've seen in biology one. You discussed it. It's an active transport mechanism within our cells. So now the sodium has come in. And when we want the sodium to go away, we send in acetylcholine esterase to get rid of all these blue dots, which means now sodium can't come in, and we're going to pump potassium in and push that sodium out. So that's kind of the chemical aspect of it. Let's talk about what happens on a mechanical aspect. And so the sliding filament model is just basically what happens down in the guts of the muscle. What happens in our muscle to make it contract? So in our last lecture, we discussed how um, our muscles are made of thick and thin filaments. The thick filaments are known as myosin. And myosin will join to actin. And actin are the thin filaments. When they join, they build something called a cross bridge. So here's a picture of the myosin head, and it's connecting to this active site on the thin filament, the actin filament, okay? So what happens is when your active site is available, it depends a lot on your calcium concentration. When calcium's low, your muscles relaxed and the active site's blocked, so you can't build a cross bridge, okay? But when our calcium levels go up, the muscle changes shape, the cross bridge can be formed, and that's what allows us to begin the actual mechanical aspect of shortening our muscles in a contraction. So what happens is that thin filament is pulled back by the thick filament, by that myosin head. The myosin head will break loose and then reach up and find another active site further on down the actin strand, connect, and then pull it again. And it looks like a ratchet-like action. And I tell people, to me, it's a lot like tug of war. So right here, the myosin head connects to the active site. It will then break, it pulls this thin away. So it's, it's making it contract. It lets go, and then it does the same thing farther down the actin um, fiber. And this keeps on going until your muscle gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, okay? So when you're looking at a muscle, this is when you use those lines. When the Z lines get closer, the sarcomere is decreasing. It tells us that there is a contraction taking place, okay? So sodium is diffused in through the neuromuscular junction. The sliding filament model is where we connect the muscles together and go through the mechanical part. Now, how do we get the sodium over here to make the calcium work? So that's what this last little part is. Um, calcium is pretty interesting. When calcium is available, our muscles will stiffen. So you've probably heard of people talking about someone when they die, their bodies become really stiff. That's because calcium doesn't rid out of the cells and it causes them to build these active sites, 
which build these or causes them to bond at the active site, building the cross bridges, and the muscle will get really, 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 really tense. Um, it only lasts for a little while until the muscles begin to break down um, with decomposition, but it's the calcium that causes these contractions. So how do we get the calcium? So the last little step of our discussion question is coupling excitation to contraction. So earlier when we discussed the action potential coming down the motor neuron, triggering the influx of sodium, that sodium actually forms a electrochemical gradient. It forms um, the, just like a, a line of, of ions so that the electrical impulse in the brain or action potential can, can, can continue to follow it. So what happens is the action potential goes down the motor neuron and it keeps on going down the um, membrane of the muscle, the sarcolemma. Every so often along the muscle, there are these little pockets of membrane that are known as the T-system. So that action potential will zip down that T-system where it um, causes the calcium-filled sarcoplasmic reticulum to release its calcium, okay? So right here, the action potential continues to follow that gradient, goes down the T-tubule in the T-system, and when it does, it ends right here at the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That allows calcium to be released, and we know that calcium causes the muscles to change shape, build a cross bridge, and cause a muscle contraction. So, when our brain tells us to have a contraction, the action potential rides down the motor neuron, causes the release of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine causes the influx of sodium, that causes the action potential to follow along the sarcolemma. It goes down into the T system, releases the calcium, and that calcium allows the cross bridge to be formed. So at the end of um, our muscle contraction, we obviously don't want to stay contracted anymore. So we are getting rid of the acetylcholine with acetylcholine esterase, but we also need to get our calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So calcium ATPase pumps the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So now we no longer have sodium coming in. And it's being pumped out by potassium. We no longer have calcium because it's been pumped back in by calcium ATPase. So now the muscle can relax. Now, what's amazing to me about this is it's such a complex process, but it takes just a split second. So everything virtually happens simultaneously from the time that we think about it to the time that we relax. It's almost like it happens in unison. So this is your discussion question for this unit. Um, once again, I would watch the video when I draw this out so that you'll have more of a visual image of this, and then you can go back and watch the video again. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me.